fished on that side. We done fished on both sides. And we caught nothing. Jesus said, go back. And this time you'll catch fish. So the Bible says that they went out back out and they cast their net on the other side, didn't they? And the Bible says that they caught a drought of fish. They were caught so many fish, and, and listen, they'd been fishing in the same place they'd fished all night and didn't get a bite. But when Jesus showed up, the fish started biting. They couldn't haul them all. So they had to get other boats to come and help and take their fish to the market. And from that moment, when Jesus showed up, everything changed. When he told them to do what? Cast it on the other side. And I got to think about that because I got a song I'm going to play for him. It called The Other Side. Now, this, this story just came to mind as I was coming here tonight. But there was a second time in their life. And it was after Jesus died. And they give up hope, like a lot of people in the world we live in today. They don't see any future ahead when they look at how dark the world seems to be today. And so Peter gathers his fishing buddies around after Jesus is gone, and he says to them, I don't think I'm going to preach anymore. I think I'm going to go back to what I used to be. I'm going to go back fishing again. That was the exact words. I'm going to go fishing again. Give up this fishers of men stuff. It ain't paying well. Jesus is gone. I don't know what's going to happen to us, so I'm going to go back to something I know and something that's safe for me. I'm going to go fishing again. So he cast back out in the ocean a second time. And guess who showed up a second time? Jesus did. And Jesus says to them, come on in. I already got breakfast fixed for you. We're going to have a meal here. And that's when Jesus says, Peter, lovest thou me? Peter said, you know I do, Lord. And he asked him three times. You know the story. And then he said to Peter, then what you need to do is don't worry about going fishing, but you need to feed my sheep. And that changed the doom and the gloom and the hopelessness because he realized what? That even though Jesus was going and gone, that as long as he lived, Jesus would always be with him. No matter how dark things might get, and they got dark for them as they began the Christian movement and started, we're going through it on Acts. We went through it. But Peter learned to trust. But you know what he learned most of all, and this is what, you know, there's many great reasons to be a Christian. I don't know how you survive a lot of things and, that go on in this world if you don't have a hope that's out of this world, right? See, my hope is not in this world. It's not in the government. It's, it's not in the Baptist Convention. My hope is in all the promises that God gave me in His Word here. God promised me, oh, this may be a dark world, but He said, you'll never go anywhere that I don't go with you. You're never going to be alone. And you know what? It's taken me a lot of my life to realize that. And now I have what I call peace about this world, but even greater than that, about the world that's on the other side. The most miserable life a person can live is not to have peace about the other side. And so Jesus said, cast your net on the other side, you'll have peace, and you'll have prosperity, and you'll have provision. Not maybe on this side, but one day we'll have it. And it'll be more than we ever dreamed. Right? The McCamus has got a song. Of course, I, Jimmy, did you put that new CD on my desk? 
I don't know it's on there. How about that? Whoever done it, thank you. I don't want him mud and slap out. Came has got a song and it's entitled. It talks about Peter and him fishing. That's how I, I got this in my head. And it talks about the other side. Okay. <laughs> of Jesus distressed and discouraged thought Jesus had left them in a bind they had given up everything to follow in his ways now he had gone and left them all behind so they went back to fishing but this time not for me They spent a lot of time and didn't catch a thing Then early the next morning They saw Jesus standing by He said, friends, throw your net on the other side On the other side You will find abundance ministry and in my life where I was just like Peter. I quit. I did. I told the church the end of December will be my last Sunday. And they said, well, where are you going? I said, I don't know where I'm going. I don't have nowhere. Are you talking to another church? No, I ain't talking to nobody. I just, it's time to quit. It's time to, I just like Peter. Every time I see that, I think, that was me. And so I turned to my resignation, and I quit. I went home, Lynn said, what you going to do? I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I tell you what, I still got a belt. Brother Charles, I still got my hooks. I still got my tools. I'm only about 50 years old then, and I said, you know what I'll do? If I have to go back climbing poles again, then that's what I'll do. I don't have enough of this pastoring stuff. 
I was just like Peter. But the night I got home, I got a phone call. That night, from Northside Baptist Church in Sumter. And they said, we're looking for a preacher. And there's a guy named Sam Smith here just recommended you to us. Would you be interested? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. But anyway, we're there. We're here. You know why? Because I quit. Didn't quit. And now, I'm partially on the other side here with y'all. Hey, what did he say? It'll be blessings when you get to the other side. And down on this earth, this has been my other side. And I thank you for that. I do. Y'all are a blessing y'all will never even know. It's wonderful. All right. I ain't hardly got time to teach tonight now. I, got all right. I heard that. I listened to that song coming over here, and then I knew about Peter, and I knew about me. And when you know about somebody, you know about you, you, yourself, it's easy. So, anyhow, let's see what we can do tonight. Acts, where we stop at. Paul in Jerusalem. Okay, verse 15, chapter 21, the book of Acts. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, dear God, that this world is not all that there is. God, as we talk about Paul tonight, he too is fixing to come to the end of his journey on this side. And he's done all you ask him to do. And one of the great quotes that Paul says, I finish my course. And I'm now ready to depart. And I always think about that, and I think about you never ready to go until you finish all you've asked us to do. And God, may that be the motto of all of us, that we're going to keep serving until we've done everything you wanted. And then, no matter how good or bad it's been, there'll be the other side which he says is joy and blessings. What a day that'll be, God, when we see you, when we sit with you, and when we sup with you. And there's no more pain and crying and tears, and there's joy on the other side. Thank you, Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Moving in a different direction the last few minutes I got here tonight. You get two sermons tonight. How about that? One expected, one unexpected. But it's always good when Jesus shows up when you ain't expecting him, right? All right. All right. When we look at Paul, where we left, we left him at Ephesus. Remember, uh, again, I keep telling you, he's, he's got two places in his, heart, in his heart that he needs or he feels like he wants to go before his time on this earth is over and he gets to the other side. First is Jerusalem, the holy, holy place. And then he wants to go back to Rome for his last journey. And tonight we find him on the second phase of his last journey. In verse 15 of chapter 21 it says, And after those days we took up our carriages and we went up to Jerusalem. We, he had Luke, and whoever else was with him, to go with him up. And remember what I told you last Wednesday night, when you speak of Jerusalem, it's always called up. And so we get our carriages, we get our troop together, and we get ready to go to the holy city of God, the city of David, Jerusalem. Now, if you remember last week, What had the people at Ephesus told him? Don't go. That's a dangerous journey you're about to make. And then they said, this is what the Holy Spirit told us, is to warn you that this is not a good idea to go there. But Paul said that the Holy Spirit has led him that he must go there. So above all the warnings and all the things that's coming, 
he sets out for the holy city. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea. That's where he left from. And brought with them one Nason of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. So what we find is he goes up to Jerusalem and carries an old gentleman with him, an old disciple of Christ with him, that evidently has a place where they can stay when they go to Jerusalem. That's the best way I can interpret that and from the things uh, that I read, that he is one of the early disciples of Christ. And evidently the, the, the writers and theologians says maybe he even had a house in Jerusalem where he lived at one time. So Paul, he goes with Paul and Luke and those to there and they have a place that they can stay when they get there. And he says, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now that's an important statement there. He didn't say everybody liked us. He didn't say everybody wanted us to be there, did he? He said who? The brethren. Now who are the brethren? Disciples of Christ, the Christians. Those that he had led to the Lord when he set out from Jerusalem and those that, you, you got to understand, he's there at time of Passover. So what happens at Passover? Christians of all over the world comes to Jerusalem to celebrate the greatest feast that they celebrate, which is Passover. So there's tons of people there and many of them were led to the Lord by Paul. And they, when they hear that Paul is coming back, oh my goodness, there's excitement in the town, not by the Pharisees, not by the scribes, not by the church leaders, but those that have given their life to the Lord under him, those that were his friends, were glad, just like the people at Ephesus were glad to see him again. Those people where he'd started churches and all had come back were glad to see this man again. Okay, so you got one group there. They received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders, and this is the elders of the church, the first Baptist church of Jerusalem. I know it had to be a Baptist church. Even though we ain't got elders. Well, I, I guess some do have elders, don't you, Miss Lynn? Don't some churches have elders? Baptists, do you, you think do? I ain't never had one. I, I, I'm now the elder. I'm older. But he goes there and he meets James. Now this James, there, there are a couple of three James that are mentioned in the Bible. There's James, the brother of John. They argued about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God. But there's James that did the brother of Jesus. He's the head honcho there. We call him today the lead pastor, the head pastor, whatever he is. He's of all the rest of everybody there. And so he goes and he meets with James and he meets with the elders of the church as he goes there. Now, the elders, as I said, were considered to be 70 men that were leaders in the church. Now, if you remember, the Sanhedrin, which it was the most religious thought of group in that day, there were 70 leaders in the Sanhedrin. So it's just assumed that as he met there, they paralleled the Sanhedrin at this huge church. Now, understand this that even though James was the head pastor of the biggest church of that day, the elders rule the church. They rule, they set the guidelines, they set the principles out there. And so he met not only with the pastor, I guess today we would call them deacons is what we would call them in the Baptist church today, but he meets with all of them in the church. And when he has saluted them, 
he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now, these elders were not Gentiles. They were Jews. And it did not thrill their heart to hear about what all Paul had done in starting these churches in pagan lands and people that were not like them became Christians and they, they were not Jews. And, and so when he said, I want to tell you, and I want, and it, listen, he laid out in great detail about his excursions, about all the churches that he pastored and all the churches that he started and all the places that he'd been and all the people that had come to the Lord. And remember in that town, that, that city at that time, they were all there. And so he tells him in great detail official report of his missionary work that he had done. And he relates to them specific ministries that he'd done. And the one thing Paul always did, if there was ever a man that probably in the Bible that maybe would have had a reason to boast he was not so humble, it was Paul. Because let's be honest, there's nobody that ever did what Paul did. There's nobody that went all over the world at that time, started churches and preaching to people, listen, that the church of that day did not even want in their church. And yet Paul accepted them, no matter who they were, no matter where they come from, if they accepted Jesus, they were welcome in the churches he pastored. You can't say that about the disciples. You can't say that about Peter. You can't say that about James. You can't say that about John. You can't say that about Bartholomew. You know why? Because for a long time in his life, Peter believed this, that the gospel was meant for the Jews. He didn't care whether anybody that was a Jew or not got saved. He didn't give a rip about them. He wouldn't go preach to them. He wouldn't eat with them. You, you know what the biggest problem that the church and the people of that hill of that had? Jesus messing around with sinners. Why you go eat with a sinner? Hey, I want to tell you something. I don't care who you go out with tonight or next week, you go eat with a sinner. Right? I ain't never had a meal that I can sit down and eat with a sinner. But nobody ever said to me, Jim, why you go out there and eat with them sinners? But they nailed Jesus for it because they didn't like the fact that we're saved by grace through faith. And it don't matter whether we're Jew, Gentile, Greek, whatever we are. Anybody can be saved, no matter what your religion is or whatever. And so here we have the sticking point of his trip there. He didn't tell them, but he stresses this. What did it say in that verse of Scripture? how he wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Now, he didn't dwell on all the Jews that had gotten saved under him. But he, got, he dwelt on the Gentiles, the non-Jews, that got saved. Now, understand, the 70 elders did not like this. The church leadership did not like the fact that he was messing with people that were sinners, that people that were not like them, they come from other places other than Israel, and these men who were very deeply Jewish did not respect the fact of the ministry that Paul had. So, when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. There ain't a but here, but I'm going to put a but here. Because they changed the whole statement they made right here. But they are all zealous of the law. 
Now, let me explain that to you as best that I know it, as he tells in them. There were some Jewish people that still believed in the Ten Commandments and the law and obedience to them. They still did their ceremonies for the law, of the Mosaic law. Now, there was another group called the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers, which were separate from those men that didn't like what he said, was a separate set of Jews that believed that you do not have to believe in the law to be saved. They did not believe that. It says some Jewish believers continued to believe the aspects of Mosaic law, but unlike the Judaizers, they did not view the law as means of salvation. Different. I got it backwards. Difference here. The Judaizers believed that in order to go to heaven, you had to keep the law. The Jews that were saved, even though they kept some of the ceremony, they went, still went to the feast and all of those things, they did not believe that it was a necessity for you to keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven. That's the difference. The Judaizers believed you had to keep the law. The Jewish believers believed that the law, and the law is important. The Ten Commandments are important. But there's nobody that ever got saved by believing in the Ten Commandments or doing them because nobody else could all do all the commandments. If we tried to keep them all, we'd go to hell wide open. I'm going to tell you that right now because nobody's ever kept them all except one man, Jesus. And so you you have the same people, but you have a different belief system. So what was going on here? The Judaizers that believed you had to believe in the Ten Commandments, the Judaizers were going red, spreading lies about the teaching that Paul was doing, saying this about him. Now listen something. If you do something people don't like, don't be surprised if they talk about you. Right? It's good to be talked about sometimes by some people. I don't want everybody out there like me. I'm going to tell you right now. Somebody asked, we were talking, I was talking to somebody today, said, how are you getting along with liberal preachers? I said, I don't know. I don't associate with them. And I don't. And they don't want to associate with me, and that's okay too. I'm perfectly fine with that. They said, you know what he's doing? This man, Paul, that y'all so enthused and enthralled with right there, He is going out and this is what he's teaching. He's teaching us Jews to forsake their heritage. I'm going to tell you something. I'm proud of my heritage. I'm proud of who I am and where I come from. I'm proud of being a Christian today. My heritage is in Jesus now. My father is Jesus. That's where I get my heritage from now. And, he's, and they get lie Paul and they get people angry against him by telling him he's going around telling people that the Ten Commandments are important. That's a lie. He never said that. You see, if people don't get along with you, they'll lie about you. And they'll try to make it sound good. That's, that's what liars do. Paul had never abandoned his, his Jewish heritage. He was half Jew. He was... Half Roman. If you remember, in the, I believe it's the 16th chapter, there was a young preacher named Timothy. He had gotten saved. He was a Jew. You know what Paul told him? You need to get circumcised. Now, what is part of the Jewish heritage? That by the time on the eighth day, you get circumcised. So Paul never said circumcision isn't important, but they said he did. They said that he'd abandoned his Jewish heritage. If you remember another episode that happened in the life of Paul, that we'll find out a little bit later on as we study on through this, there's a time in Paul's life where he took the vow of a Nazarite. 
Now, the vow of a Nazarite means certain things that the Jewish people believed. You don't touch dead bodies. You don't cut your hair. You don't drink alcohol. And, that is, and if you're going to take the Jewish Nazarite vow, then you've got to swear that you're not going to do any of those things. And Paul took that vow. So why would you take a vow of something that you were preaching against? You see what I'm saying? They were lying. You know one thing I hate about news and people? Now, if you're lying, you're lying. You know what's wrong with our society today? We try to make everything nice and pretty, don't we? I hear people say, well, you know, I can't say this, but it's, it's just an untruth. He's not telling the whole story. No, the truth of the matter is he's lying. Get up and call him a liar. That's what I do. Have I done that before? I sure have. I can tell you, but I had somebody told a lie on me one time. I went to their house, took my chairman deacons with me. I did. Word got to me about what was said, and it was a lie. You do all right with me if you, unless you lie on me. Now, if you lie on me, we've got problems. I'm going to tell you that right now. So I get, called my chairman deacon. I said, you need to come go with me. We need to take a trip. I don't ask this person face to face if they said what they said. So I go to their house. They're out there riding on the lawnmower. I pull up. My chairman, my chairman of Deacon's eye, we get out. They cut the lawnmower off and they come over down the shade tree where we're at. And I just point blank ask them. I need to know if you said this about me or not. And they were honest. They didn't lie. They said, yes, we did. And I looked at them and I said, well, then you're a liar because you know that's not true. And I can prove to you that it's not true. They took their head down. They walked back, got on their lawnmower. I got in my car and left, and I never seen them again. They never come back to church. Never. Ever. They were telling lies on Paul, claiming things that were very important that were not true that he was doing. And so he'd taken the Nazarite vow, which is a Jewish symbol of devotion to God. That's what the Nazarite vow, that he was a Jew and he was devoted. Paul never one time pushed aside his Jewish heritage. Never in all of his writings and all the things that he'd done did he ever say, I'm not a Jew anymore. No. Never did. So it was an untruth, as the news media would say today. An untruth. And they informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among Gentiles to forsake Moses. They told us that this is what you said. Now, if you're going to quote somebody and you don't want repercussions from it, then you better be sure of what you're saying. Don't do like the news media says and say, well, we've got a anonymous sources on this. No, no. Anonymous sources don't get it. I'm going to tell you that right now. If you say something, you better know what you're saying. And even me, because Dwight's got copies of all my sermons, I can take you back there and tell you whether I said it or not. So be careful. They informed us of thee, Paul, that thou teachest all the Jews, not just some of them, but this is your pattern. You teach everybody this. Every Jew hears this from you that they need to forsake Moses. Well, who was the great hero of the Jewish people? Moses was. In Paul's ministry, he used Moses as an example. So why would you use somebody's example and tell them that they don't need to believe that or trust in that? That's ignorant. 
saying that they ought not to circumcise their children when he told Timothy, you need to get circumcised. Lie. Neither to walk after their customs, after their laws, after their traditions. Paul attended the, the feast. There's seven feasts in the Bible. When it was time to uh, four in the spring and three in the fall and Paul went to him. You know who else went to him? Jesus. He was a Jew. But he kept for his life. He went to the synagogue. He, he kept, he, when he died, he was in Jerusalem for a feast. So they lied about both of them. That's why he hung on the cross, because they told lies on him. So this is the question, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop. I want to get a little further, but we'll stop there. This is the question. What is it there for? So they look at Paul and they say, what's the truth? Did you teach this or did you not? This is what we've heard. What do you have to say to defend yourself here? So this is a, the weird deal here. Paul has gone there to tell these people what God has done in his life. He walks up there in a great mood just to tell about all the churches and, and to tell about all the people that have been saved and how God had provided him with the money and all the things to do his ministry with and how God had been so good to him. And the first thing they begin to do is what? criticize him, lie about him. And so you know what happens? Like always, the mood changes, doesn't it? Paul realizes he's under attack here. By the same people that had sent him out to do the work, now they're attacking him because he led Gentiles to the Lord instead of Jews. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs come together. So we've got a division here between the Jews and the Judaizers. The Jews are the one that listened to Paul preach and said anybody can be saved, and many of the Jews were saved and baptized and became Christians. And you've got the Judaizers that said, you have lied in your ministry. You have told people that they did not have to keep their hair. They could not keep their Jewish tradition. And Paul never said that. So the rubber's about to meet the road here. Do therefore this that we say unto thee. And what they're saying here is, Paul Whatever you tell us, we're not just going to take your word for it. You're going to have to prove to us that what you said is true, that you do believe in the Jewish traditions, that you have not cast the Jews away. But you need to understand this, and i got to let it go with that because time is eating me up here. Um... Do therefore what we say to thee. And we have four men which have a vow on them. Now what this is, is this. We've got four men in the church that have come to take the Nazarite vow. Now what did I tell you? They've accepted the Lord. You know, we do baptism. When we do baptism... That's the sign that the old life is buried and the new life has is, is come up and we're following Jesus and we're new creatures. And that's what baptism symbolizes. It don't save you. I don't care what other churches say. There's no saving power in water. If you do, you can go in your bathtub and dunk. 
That's all I got to say. You can do that. But what we want you to do is through these four men prove to us that what you say is true. And I've heard this. I've never had this happen, but I've, I've heard of it before in other churches. That they have a trial period sometime for people that come and say they've been saved and love the Lord. And before they'll baptize them, they have a two-month, a three-month, a fourth-time trial period to see if, what, if they really were saved before they baptize them. See if they come to church. See if they tie. See if they quit drinking or they quit doping or quit running around or whatever is on their mind. They stop all that and they prove by evidence of their life that what they meant was true. And then after they've gone through the trial period, if everything looks good, and they check all the boxes, then we'll take it there and baptize you. That's what's going on here. That happens, folks. They said, you've got to prove to us that what you said is true. And you're going to have to do it here. So do what we say. We've got four men which have a vow on them. They've already promised. Now they've got to go through the procedure. Got to go through the steps of the vow. Then take and purify thyself with them. In other words, if what you say is true, then you ought to be willing to take the same vow and go through the same thing that these four men are. Prove yourself. Go through the Nazarite. Well, what's the deal here? Paul had already done it one time. And folks, you can't get saved but one time. You, can't, you can take, it's just like I say about baptism, you can get baptized and you know every bug in that pond back there, but if you ain't saved, you ain't never really got baptized. But you got to prove it to us before we'll believe you. Purify yourself with them and be at charges with them. You know what that means? <laughs> I learned a lot in my study that I never knew before. You had to pay to take the Nazarite vows. You had to pay the priest and those to take the Nazarite vows in the church. You had to pay for it. And they say to Paul, if you're serious about this, you must pay for yourselves and pay for these for their, your charge, so you have to pay for us to do this. And if you pay us for you and these four men, then that would add a lot of credibility to the things you've said. Ain't that something? You need to understand, this joke of Steve, now they, these priests and all, they, they did what they did. You know why they let people sell, bir sell birds and donkeys out there in the place where you went to church so they can make money. For some people in churches, it's all about the money. I hate to say that, but it is. They'll rob you blind in the name of the Lord. If you don't believe it, turn on your television every day and look at old what's-his-face that says, send me $1,000 and God will give you 10000 Get this prayer rag, see me a thousand dollars, and rub it on your sores, Mr. Jim, rub it on your head, and you'll be healed. Preacher, you don't mean it. Well, just turn around. I get about ten Christian, or supposed to be Christian TV stations, four or five of them I want him to tune into. But, folks, I looked at this as I've been studying this stuff. I'm learning so much new to me. The same thing that's going on in the church world today with these prosperity guys and all that was going on 2,000 years ago in the church. It's this in a greater... they got jet planes and condos and places like that off the backs of people. That was going on 2,000 years ago. The priests done that. They got half the money. The tax collectors collected collect the money. He got a third, and they got two-thirds of it. Taxes. No wonder they won't tax the church. I got to quit. Time's done gone. Where am I at? 
that, that you may take a charge, pay for them, that they may shave their head. I pay to get a haircut. They got to pay in the church to get somebody to come shave their head. How about that? And all may know that those things where they were informed of concerning thee are nothing. In other words, if you do these things, if you pay us for these men, if you go along again and do the Nazarite vows, get your head shaved, promise to not drink, promise to this, then if you do that, then we'll consider that the things that have been said about you are not true. But you've got to pay for it. You've got to pay for it. You've got to go over, you've got to, to be baptized again. And if you get baptized again, that'll prove to us that you're not lying. Ain't that something? But that thou walkest also thyself orderly, and you keep the law. Got to stop there. It's time before we go. I'll stop it right there. All right. If you pay for them, if you get in there with them, get your head shaved, Promise not to touch a dead thing. Promise not to um, drink alcohol. Do, you know, Samson took that Nazarite vow, didn't he? That's why his hair got so long after he shaved it. And he wouldn't shave it again after it come back. And Delilah got a hold to him. You know why? Because he broke the vow. He would have got his hair cut. But, If you do these things and you walketh orderly. <laughs> In other words, what they're saying is orderly is walking the way they tell you to walk. See what I'm saying? If you listen to our rules and laws and you walk in them, then we'll know you're not lying. But you've got to do it our way. And then... Finally, he says, and you must keep the law. What is the point of contention in everything we've talked about tonight? The law. Keeping the Old Testament law. That's the whole point of contention here. And Paul has taught and preached that you're saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. The law is about works. None of that ever saved anybody. So we'll stop there. Time's gone. Way gone. I want to share with you. Brother Jay gave me a, you know, we've been buying Bibles and uh, sending them out. And I'm sure, without a doubt, when we pray and we send those Bibles out, people are getting saved. I just believe that with all my heart. And so we've purchased thus far just a few short, 889 of nine hundred Bibles. South Side Baptist Church that are gone out into all the world. We might can't reach them, but we can send stuff to teach them, can't we? We took up in the month of July. Ain't that something? Through July, we've taken up over $1,100 just giving a dollar on Wednesday night. That's, that's the most amazing. It's like mission giving on Sunday night. All as a birthday for Jesus. Total, we've given up January through July $1,100. In the month of July, we took up $215. And we've done what Jesus said. He said, send the gospel in the all world. When you send Bibles out, you send in the gospel out. Okay. All right, prayer list. God, right, you got us off, buddy. <laughs>